we bought that for the Nick because we thought the Nick could use them, but we didn't realize that <laughs> they were sort of ugly wear bait. She is not an attractive. She's unattractive. Yeah. She's unfortunate. John Koch here, John Koch Antiques. I'm Kevin Creighton. I'm the manager of John Koch Antiques. We're an antique shop on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And we specialize in the sets for TV and movies. We buy estates for the most part, so we get people's whole lives. We were sort of spilled them out on the floor and other dealers would come and with them came the set decorators and production designers that did the television shows and movies. The first of which was probably Woody Allen. Sex in the City. The Nick. The Blacklist. Vinyl. The Good Wife. Mad Men. Gotham. Wolf of Wall Street. Ugly Betty. Madam Secretary. Deuce with James Franco. Saturday Night Live. I think we've done almost every the ice storm. Admissions. Girl on a train. Gossip Girl. Igby goes down. Other than that, it's just the people that come in that you're really surprised at, like Louis C.K. And he actually asked to use the store's location for his season finale last year. And then the producer came over to me and said, Louis wants to know if you'll like do him a favor and be in the show. I want to get that for her. Okay. How much, how much is it? $4.95. Okay, I don't want to get it. I'm working on Louis C.K. shows is just like an honor. You know, I would do it for free. You have to cut that. <laughs> was our first feature uh, Point Break? Did we do that before no, Tremors? Not officially, yeah. Right. So as a company, Tremors would be the first, technically, the yeah. first feature. I guess. I don't know. Someone should Google that. Are you going to ask us <coughs> questions or do you want us to start talking? Could you introduce each other? I would love to. I would like to introduce you to Tom Woodruff Jr., who is the co-founder of Amalgamated Dynamics. I'd like to introduce you to Alec Gillis. He's the co-founder of ADI, home of the Oscar-winning Creature Effects team. When people think of practical effects creatures, you think of non-computer generated characters. We've been lucky to be involved with some of the biggest and best of uh, those types of monsters. We did the worms and tremors. We did the fat makeups on Tim Allen and the Santa Claus. All the practical animals in Jumanji. We've done the alien, we've done the predator. Starship we've... troopers. I wasn't done. Well, you can keep going, buddy. And of course, there's always the gorilla. Cut, right now that's perfect, right? That, now we cut putting the gorilla costume. We started performing our own creatures because we both had this sort of uh, observation of stuntmen, despite their talents and their skills, them going into a creature suit and not really knowing how to make a creature suit work. It would be very weird for us to just say, we're going to build something and then bring it to set and say, now what? Are you hungry? You want some food? Are you hungry? If you're a digital animator, you build the character and you follow through and you make it move and you bring it to life. So that's our philosophy is the final step is performance because that's where it lives. You want to try a little tiny piece? Here. Go ahead. Go ahead. What do you think? You want some more? You hey, hey, he's listen, listen, I can get you fresh bread. I can I can get you fresh bread. Tremors is an example of a film that was from the pre-digital era. And if you look at it, the practical effects, they've stood the test of time and we're proud of that. Digital effects can do things that we can't possibly do. Practical effects have a presence to them that, that even the best CGI work gets close to but doesn't completely achieve. In other words, there's more emotion, I believe, to a practical creature than to a digital creature. Wave to the camera and say goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. He's so temperamental. When we get pulled over in the back cars, uh, luckily a lot of the police officers just want their picture taken with it. Yes, sir, you can. Please do. We've created the back car from the Michael Keaton Batman movie, the mystery machine from Scooby-Doo, everything from Herbie the Love Bug to the Land Speeder from Star Wars. We create a lot of wild rides out of some junk. In the past two or three years, we've created uh, 15, 16 iconic movie cars. I had a real job at one time at a major airline. 
We initially started out refurbishing old cars. We decided we were going to start making some iconic cars that you could actually get in and out of it, drive it, kids can climb on it and look at it. Typical builds can be anywhere from uh, as little as two weeks to as much as three years. The Speed Racer Mach 5 sitting here beside us started off as a 94 Corvette. Hopefully here in about 30 days it'll be finished up, have a great big honking M on the hood of it and it'll look awesome. There's a tremendous amount of trial and error. A lot of these cars have a lot of fiberglass on them. It's a labor of love to come out and just continue putting down layers and layers of fiberglass. Ugh, you can't go to O'Reilly's or Advanced Auto Parts and ask them for a part for a back car. Our Eleanor from Gone in 60 Seconds car up front is absolutely as screen accurate as we can get it from the stainless aluminum interior to the seats, to the shifter, the go baby switch in the center. And we drive Eleanor just like it's supposed to be driven. That's why it was built. Everything we have, we take out and drive, every single piece. We take it all to the local stores, we go to McDonald's. What better thing to get groceries in than the back car? This story begins in California. To be more specific, here, in an unspecified studio lot. This is the story of a TV producer, a physicist, and the man who brought them both together. That's Wendy. I'm one of the co-producers on Marvel's Agent Carter. In 2015, ABC released the show Agent Carter, about a secret agent working in the late 1940s. In season two, they debuted a character named Jason Wilkes. Jason is a scientist who works at Isodyne Energy. And a science character needs to sound like a real scientist, kind of like this. Peggy enters to find Howard at the chalkboard with Wilkes. Lambda is given, given by, by Planck's, Planck's constant, constant divided by mc. Except we can't calculate m without an accurate reading of your mass. No mass, no wavelength. So you need to write sciencey dialogue, write sciencey stuff on the chalkboard, and have a sciencey looking lab. But you don't have any science writers on staff? No, unfortunately, we do not. So what did you do? Uh, we called our friends up at the National Academy of Sciences. Hi, the exchange. It's Rick. This is Rick. Hey, I'm Rick. I work at the National Academy of Sciences. We connect scientists and engineers with people in Hollywood. People like Wendy? Yeah, we connected her with Clifford. Hi. My name is Clifford Johnson. I am a professor in the physics and astronomy department at USC. So it goes like this. Rick pairs Clifford with Wendy. And they work together to bring real science into TV shows. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For example, I got an email one time saying, so how do you build an atomic bomb? And I had to sort of help them with that. It was a lot of fun. Rick's team has a database with a lot of scientists in it, over 2,000, and they've worked on some major blockbuster films. Iron Man 2 and 3, The Avengers Age of Ultron, Batman vs. Superman, Star Trek Into Darkness, Mission Impossible 5. Films and narrative have been inspiring people since the 19th century to go out and do great things and build great things. We're not trying to be the accuracy police. We're not fact checkers per se. What our goal is, is to inspire more scientist characters and better science in mainstream media projects. And that's the story about the hotline for scientists in Hollywood. Are these changes, Rick? Popcorn, movies, a match made in theater heaven. But there was a time when this was banned. Popcorn has been around for over 8,000 years. But when it hit American streets in the mid-1800s, it took off. It was cheap and could be mass-produced on the go. Not to mention, it smelled amazing. It was the go-to snack at circuses, sporting events, and fairs. In fact, the only place you wouldn't find popcorn was at the movies. You see, going to the movies used to be a major event. 
The only people that went were fancy rich folks because you had to be educated enough to read. Fancy, like there was even a coat check. But there was definitely no concession stand. There was, however, popcorn street vendors who set up shop outside theaters. They made a killing selling to waiting theater goers. Theater goers that started smuggling their pop treats inside. Not cool. Early movie theaters kindly asked patrons check their popcorn before entering. Then, in 1927, films started adding sound, meaning everyone went to the movies. The Great Depression followed, making movies a cheap escape. Huge crowds plus crunch muffling sound equaled another revenue opportunity for theater owners. By 1945, over half the popcorn consumed in America was being eaten at the movies, a marriage that has continued ever since. To get ourselves a treat.